Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to IWM's live teaching and prayer. It's good to be with you today. Thank you for coming in. Come on in. Join us. Come into the house, so to speak. I'm glad to be with you here today. I'm glad to be able to share what the Lord has downloaded to me in the past few days. I, I've been praying and seeking the Lord and asking him what I should teach on next. And his, his theme has not changed for me. He is still wanting to deliver the message to the body of Christ. Um, the theme returned to him. Um, it's heavy on my heart. It is what I dream about at nighttime. The Lord speaks to me at night about the condition of the body of Christ. The Lord continues to speak to me through his word about the condition of the body of Christ, mostly to pray, mostly to pray for the health of the body of Christ. My heart is in tune with what the Lord um, wants to happen in the year 2025, and that is to bring the body of Christ into health and into right standing with the Lord. And that's going to be my prayers of intercession um, throughout the rest of this year and into next year is just praying for the health of the body of Christ. It is um, heavy on the Lord's heart. When, when the Lord gives me a theme, I pay attention. When he keeps speaking to me along the same lines, I sit up and take notice because there is something on the Holy Spirit's heart for the body of Christ in this season. We need to be watching and waiting and preparing for his coming. And the only way we can do that is to surrender and be obe in obedience to him, right? For far too long, the church has been lackadaisical about their relationship with the Lord. And for far too long, the Lord, the, the church has um, abandoned the teachings of the word and lived in their comfort zone here, especially in the U.S. We are comfortable. Um, gone are the days of just showing up. To church. Gone are those days. God is wanting to prepare his bride for his coming. He's going to deal with all the hidden sins. He's going to deal with the brokenness in the church. He's going to bring us back into repentance and right standing with him. Amen. Amen. If you're here with me this morning, say hello. I would love to speak to you. Um, sometimes people watch later and I respond later as well. So if you're joining us after the live event, please let us know you're watching. And if you have a prayer request, I'll be happy to join you in prayer for those things that are on your heart. And just excited to be able to be in the word with you again. For the next four weeks, we're going to be studying the book of Ruth. And honestly, I'm seriously thinking about it, doing an in-person Bible study on the book of Ruth in the new year. So maybe if you're in the local Charlottesville area, you want to join International Women's Ministries in a four-week study, let me know that. Uh, I'm thinking about doing it in person. But today, I just wanted to share with you... Um, a couple of things that are on my heart for IWM. I am Autumn Mims. I'm the CEO of International Women's Ministries. And the 
Lord has called me to wipe the tears of sisters globally. He has called this ministry to be tear wipers for God. And that is what we do. And right now I wanted to share with you that in the Philippines, they have experienced several typhoons that have brought utter devastation to the nation of the Philippines. And if you look and scroll down our front page of International Women's Ministries on Facebook and Instagram, you will see that there is a call to action to um, help us help them, help us to wipe the tears of our sisters overseas in the Philippines. Um, it's on my heart this morning. I spoke with Dr. Joy Tika. She is on the ground distributing food, distributing um, resources to the people on the ground that have lost everything. We have we sent funds yesterday. We need to send more funds. She is being the hands and feet of Jesus to her people. And who better to do it than a native missionary, right? A person that speaks the language, understands the culture, knows the people well. We just want to walk alongside of her and help make provisions for what she's trying to do on the ground there to show the love of Christ in devastating times, right? So you'll notice in the comment section of um, this live event this morning, we are focusing on the relief effort for the Philippines. There is a link where you can give, or you can give directly to the donate button on Facebook. We are a 501c3. We are recognized by the government all of your giving is tax deductible and we have a five-star rating with candid a watchdog group for nonprofits so you can rest assured that we are transparent with our finances and we believe in giving all to Christ so let's focus today on the Philippines and helping to restore that nation back to health. Amen. But today, the Lord has placed the book of Ruth on my heart. And, and it is always good to go back through and um, study a book that you've already studied. I've studied Ruth. I've read Ruth a number of times. I've taught from Ruth a number of times. And today I'm going to teach from it again. I'm going to fix my camera a little bit. I'm in the house alone, which is rare. And so it's nice that to know that hopefully there won't be any distractions or disturbances while we're doing this um, Bible study today. Today we are focusing on the book of Ruth, chapter one. <coughs> Excuse me. And... I'm excited to be able to teach from this book today, and for the next four weeks, I plan to teach from the book of Ruth, but today, I wanted to focus on this amazing book. It's an incredible story of commitment, dedication, trials, testing, deliverance, and freedom. This book has it all. Well, except for the part of a nasty villain, but... Other than that, this is a historical book in the Old Testament. I believe that the Holy Spirit has placed this book within the Bible for its historical benefits. He has placed the characters in this Bible, the storyline and key elements and pictures in this Bible to teach us a glimpse of the progressive stages of our walk with Christ. I love that. This book really does show how we can progress in our, our growth steps with the Lord. Amen. And so without further ado, I want to enter into chapter one that gives us an interesting picture involving three different women. Naomi, 
Ruth and Orpah. And it's interesting that we'll see a backslider, a new convert, and a double-minded woman all in this one chapter of Ruth. So we'll focus on those things today and we'll talk about counting the cost of serving the Lord. Today we'll learn some things about the perils of worldliness and sin, the importance of sharing the gospel, the steps of um, returning to the Lord, and the cost involved in following the Lord. There is a cost. So let's just start right now with Ruth, um, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. Now it came about in the days when the judges governed that there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah, in Judah went to sojourn in the land of Moab with his wife and his two sons. And the name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of the wife, Naomi, and the names of the two sons were Malon and Chilion, Ephrathites of Bethlehem in Judah. Now they entered the land of Moab and remained there. The book of Ruth starts in the days of Judges, which at the end of the book of Judges, you'll see in those days, there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so we're going to find that Elimelech and Naomi did the same thing. They did what they thought was right in their own eyes. And in a time of famine, no less, Elimelech and his wife Naomi are living in Israel, God's chosen land, and yet we read that their eyes began to look to the prosperity of the world. Their eyes began to wander. Let that sink in. Have you ever been in a place where you've been waiting on the Lord to answer? You've been in some type of famine, perhaps you've been in a time of sickness, perhaps you've been in a time of, of a job search or a career change, perhaps you've been waiting um, for that promotion at work, or you've been waiting for your ministry to take off, but the waiting has been a long time. The, the famine has been hard. And suddenly you find yourself putting your eyes on the things of the world to seek and to satisfy you. And this is a clear picture of what happened with Elimelech and Naomi. They left Israel, their God's chosen land, and they went to Moab to seek out what they needed during this famine. You know, sometimes we do this when life gets hard, right? <laughs> sometimes, you know, the enemy will lay out a picture for us of what could be if we would just stop trusting in the Lord, if we would just take our eyes off of what's happening if we would move out of the promised land to a place that looks better for a provision, instead of trusting the Lord for what he might have for us in a difficult season. You know, sometimes we do go through those times where we wonder if God cares, if he even knows what our needs are. Sitting and waiting for that provision is hard. Sitting and waiting for Jehovah Jireh to show up is hard, right? And that's exactly what happened with Elimelech and Naomi. They looked for other solutions. Instead of hoping in the Lord, 
they hoped in other solutions. Elimelech, Elimelech, <laughs> and Naomi were in such a desperate situation that the, instead of running to God and instead of trusting him, they chose the former and ran to a land that the hand of the Lord was not upon, upon, and ultimately it cost Elimelech and his sons their lives. We read that they left Bethlehem, which is called the place of bread. We're going to, we're going to study some names today. I'm excited about that. Um, these names speak. They, they left Bethlehem, the place of bread in Judah a place of praise to go to Moab, which means what father? And in the meaning of Moab, we gain an understanding of Elimelech's state of mind as he doubts the love of his heavenly father and he takes disobedient steps to walk away from God and seek what the world might have to offer him. Striving in his own strength. Oh, I've done it. I'll admit it. I have taken action before in my own strength. Even if you know, Elimelech meant for this to just be a sojourn, a short journey. While things were hard in Israel, I'm sure he was thinking, I'll return once things get better in Israel. Oh, that's what the enemy does to us, right? He tempts us. He tempts us to leave what God has promised and established for us to go to a place that looks better, but ultimately means death. Basically, Elimelech rebelled against God for a time and entered a land that God did not call him to go to. So let's look at Ruth 1, verses 3 through 5. I see some folks out there. Good morning. Good morning, Mara. Bless you. I'm so glad you're with us today. How are you doing, sister? Um, met Mara in Mexico. It's good to see her again. Let's take a look now at Ruth chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left with her two sons, and they took for themselves Moabite women as wives. The name of one was Orpah and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about 10 years. Then both Malon and Chilion also died. And the, the woman was bereft of her two children and her husband. 10 years. That was not a short stay in Moab, was it? You know, Elimelech was probably thinking, this is, I'm just going here for a short season, but sadly he never came out. And this is a picture of what sin can do to our lives, right? This is a picture when we walk out of God's chosen place for us, a place of bread, a place of praise to go where there's no famine so that we can find other food to eat. Instead of waiting on the Lord, Elimelech lost his life there. That was the cost of turning away from God's community for a season. That was the cost of leaving a place the Lord had prepared, even though it was a difficult place. God never promises us God never promises us that everything's going to be perfect and come up roses, right? Being a Christian is hard. 
serving the Lord out of obedience is hard. And Elimelech took his eyes off of the Lord and carried his family out of the place of bread to a place of having no father, no God watching over him, emptiness, brokenness. Ruth's sons married Moabite women there. The promises that Moab, um, the promises, you know, that um, the enemy likes to make to us in our seasons of difficulty. Maybe it's the promise of fame. Maybe it's the promise of fortune or happiness. Nothing can compare to the peace and hope that comes from knowing that you were right with the Lord. This is also a picture of another story in the Bible, the prodigal son who left his father's house, who went out for a season and spent his entire inheritance, wasted it, and ended up eating with the pigs. That's exactly what Moab did for Naomi. It took her husband and it took her sons. You know, sin can seem fun for a season. God is calling the body of Christ to return to him in obedience. Return to him in repentance. Return to him with expectancy that no matter what season you find you're in, whether it's in the mountaintop season or the valley season, he has a special place prepared for you. I think it's no coincidence that Malon's name meant sickly and Chilion's name meant pining. Can you imagine your children's names being that? Malon died and Chilion died. And, you know, I'm just thinking, was, was Chilion pining, hoping for something better in life? And ultimately he died with no hope. I mean, what a picture of what sin can do to us. Um, what a picture of what Moab can do to us. Then we have also the introduction of two new characters in this scripture, Ruth, whose name means friendship, and Orpah, whose name means stiff-necked. I think it's interesting that some people can, can live up to their names, right? Ruth's name means friendship and Orpah's name means stiff neck. Let's move on to the next portions of scripture. Ruth 1, 6 through 10. Let's read it. Then she arose with her daughter-in-laws that she might return from the land of Moab, for she had heard in the land of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and giving them food. So she Parted from the place where she was and her two daughters-in-law with her. And they went on the way to return to the land of Judah, the land of praise. And Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the, with the dead and with me. May the Lord grant you... May the Lord grant that you find rest each in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them and lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, but we will surely return with you to your people. Finally, a good decision is made. <laughs> Naomi decides to return to return to Bethlehem, the house of bread, in Judah, the place of praise, where she had been estranged from for 10 years. 
She was coming back. She was seeing that Moab had done nothing but brought her death and grief. She was seeing the situation very clearly. Just like the prodigal when he returned home, Naomi was seeing Naomi was seeing her home very clearly now and that she had walked away from the provision, the community that the Lord had given her. And she had doubted and now she was coming repenting. You know, I can't help but think, you know, how painful it is when we go and we live in sin for a season when we live away from the land that the Lord has blessed us with, when we walk away for a time, maybe walking away from your family, maybe walking away from your husband or your wife or your children, perhaps you saw the, the grass was greener on the other side, the promise on the other side of the fence seemed greater but Naomi came to her senses and realized that Moab cost her much. Often we do not count the cost of what it means to walk away from the community, to turn from the Lord in our um, time of struggle, what that means, the cost for for Naomi, the cost was great. She lost three family members. And you know, another picture I see here, Elimelech's sin not only impacted him with death, but it impacted Naomi. It impacted his, her, their sons. Sin doesn't just cost you. It costs others as well. There's nothing worse than being re the recipient of someone else's sin, you know. There's nothing worse than feeling the impact of someone else's sin. Oh, when the husband walks away from his marriage, it doesn't just impact him. It impacts the children. It impacts the wife. It impacts the whole family. Sin takes you way farther than you ever expected to go. And I think if you would have had a chance to talk to Elimelech, he would have said this. This took me way further. It cost me my life. Ruth 1 Verses 11 through 13, let's read those. But Naomi said, return my daughters. Why should you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Return my daughters, go for I am too old to have a husband. If I said I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight and also bear sons, would you therefore wait until they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is harder for me than for you. For the land, for the hand of the Lord has gone forth against me. Now here, Naomi is telling them, if you come with me, life is not going to be easy. You're entering a land where you, you don't know. You're entering a land that you don't know, a God that you won't recognize, and I'm not promising you that it's going to be easy, and things are not going to come up roses is basically what she was saying. You could end up being alone. You could end up being by yourself if you follow me. <laughs> She's basically saying all she can to turn them away. Isn't that what um, 
sometimes, you know, I think we paint a picture that everything's going to be great when we come to the Lord, but it's not. Serving Jesus is a narrow road. It's a hard road. We are not promised that things are going to become perfect. But God loves us and he does want to bless us. But, you know, the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We all face challenges. But the beauty of it is we deepen our relationship with the Lord as we go. He does good things in us when we suffer for him, when we struggle, when we turn our eyes and our hearts to him in obedience. In essence, Naomi was telling Ruth and Orpah, count the cost of serving my God. Count the cost. And so... Here's where we see their reaction. Ruth 1, 14 through 18. And they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So Orpah kisses her mother-in-law goodbye, and Ruth grabs hold of Naomi. Then she said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and her gods return after your sister-in-law but ruth said do not urge me to leave you or take or turn back from following you for where you go i will go and where you lodge i will lodge your people shall be my people and your god my god where you die i will die and there i will be buried thus may the lord do to me and worse if anything but death parts you and me. When she saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. This is just a beautiful picture of true conversions. Orpah left. Orpah decided it wasn't going to be for her. She had promised to come back with Naomi earlier, but when she learned of what it may be like, she decided to do a 180 and go back to her own people. And sadly, this is what happens with many so-called Christians today. They come to the Lord. Well, they come to the front of the stage, but where are they a few days later? No one ever sees them again. Or they may stay for a while, springing up quickly, like the word says, Yet when persecution or hardship comes, they leave the faith. They go for a more comfortable life. But not Ruth. Ruth, we get an awesome picture of a true conversion. Even when others are leaving around her, she states her utter dedication and commitment to Naomi. Do not urge me to leave or turn back from following you. For where you go, I will go. Have you said that to the Lord lately? Where you go, I will go. Your people will be my people. I will die with you. I will die for you. Only death can part us. That the beauty of eternity, though, is that we we have an eternal relationship with the Lord, right? The the trials on this earth are but for a moment. Eventually, we'll see the Lord face to face. Eventually, we have the victory. You know what? Ruth, whose name means friendship, basically outlines her commitment to Naomi. Ruth was willing to give up all that she knew and loved to follow Naomi and Naomi's God. I, I've worked with many Muslims 
in different parts of the world. And one of the things that they state to me all the time when, when, when they come to know Christ, that they are literally walking away from everything that they have known. It has been ingrained in them from the time they are born to serve Allah. It is ingrained in their lifestyle. Is Christ ingrained in your lifestyle? Are you so committed to him that nothing can separate you from him. To turn from everything that you ever knew like Ruth did. To turn and look to the one true God. Ruth counted the cost. And she decided it was worth it. She decided to follow Naomi and Naomi's God, the one true God. Is your testimony such that people would say, I believe just by the example of your life, to return to your people, to return to the house of bread, the house of praise. Do people say, I want to follow you because you follow hard after your Lord? Do people look at your life that way? Ruth looked at Naomi's life that way. What a powerful, powerful truth for us to live our lives in such a way that people want to follow and not turn back. How beautiful is that? Finally, let's read Ruth, 19, Ruth chapter 1, verses 19 through 22. So they both went until they came to Bethlehem, and it came about when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was stirred because of them. And the women said, it is, is this Naomi? So she was recognized right away. And she said to them, do not call me Naomi, call me Mara. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Naomi means pleasant. Mara means bitter. Since the Lord has witnessed against me and the Almighty has afflicted me. So Naomi returned and with her Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, who returned from the land of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. So they make it back to Bethlehem. But Naomi, which means pleasant, doesn't want to be called that anymore. She prefers now to be called Mara, which means bitter. Nice name to give yourself, right? We can understand her sorrow, though, right? For she has lost her husband and her sons. And there's no point in blaming God because they made the decision to walk away from the community of God on their own. It's a hard lesson to learn when we decide to look at the grass that is greener on the other side rather than trusting the Lord for where he has us right now in this season. My question to you is where does the Lord have you right now? When we look to the world that produces death, I think we have made that very clear. You know, sometimes we think of um, sin for a season, that it's just a temporary stay, but it's never temporary. Sin costs. Sin costs us much. It brings death. 
which is very evident in what we saw in the life of Naomi. The Lord is saying, return. Return to the house of bread. Return to the land of praise. He desires a relationship with us and the chastening and the discipline which is described in Hebrews 12, 5 through 11 is only for a time to bring us back into right relationship with him. Naomi may have come back empty and bitter, but that is not how things would end. Having returned, she would once again see the blessings of the Lord. I think it's interesting that she returned in the beginning of the barley season, as this is the season of first fruits. Um, though bitter, they would soon see new life. We shall continue with the story of Ruth next week, chapter 2. I hope you will take some time to study it for yourself. But remember, repentance and returning to the Lord can sometimes be humbling. I, I get a picture of Naomi, you know, walking through the streets of Bethlehem and people going, hey, isn't that Naomi? She's come back. She's back. Naomi, the pleasant one has returned to us, but Naomi says, don't call me Naomi. Call me bitter. Don't call me pleasant. I am broken. I've lost my husband. I've lost my sons. I've lost everything but this close friend, Ruth, who has decided to come and join the family of God, who has decided to come with me because she sees more hope here in the house of bread than in the fatherless land of Mohad. What a beautiful picture of returning to the Lord. Brother, sister, I beseech you in the name of Jesus Christ to return with your whole heart to the Lord. Return from the land of Moab, the fatherless land. Return to the house of bread, the house of praise. Repent from your sins. Humbly return. It will be bittersweet. It's hard sometimes to admit when we're wrong, right? Naomi had to admit before her friends when she returned, I made a bad decision. I'm walking down the street now being noticed. I'm doing the walk of shame before my community because I left for a season But I'm back. I'm back. I'm humbly coming back to my community. I'm humbly returning to the place of praise. So this week, consider where you are in your walk with the Lord. Have you looked to the land of Moab for provision? Or are you remaining steadfast in your walk in obedience before the Lord? Not looking to the right or the left, but keeping your eyes fixed on the one who is the author and the finisher of our faith. And that is Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's pray about that right now. Father God, 
<laughs> thank you for this beautiful picture of how sometimes we turn from you, how sometimes we don't wait for your answer to come, how sometimes when we're in the, when we're in the midst of our struggle, our famine, we look outward to the world for the provision, Lord, but you are our provision. You've given us our community to live in, the body of Christ. You came to seek and save that which was lost. Oh, Father God, help us not to look over where the grass is greener on the other side. And not to be enticed and tempted by the world to leave the land of promise. Remind us, Lord, that sin equals death. That we may enter into sin for a season, but it brings death, just like it did for Naomi. Sin promises much, but delivers little. Sin boasts of big things, but gives back nothing. Sin only knows how to steal, kill, and destroy us. Oh Lord, we repent. We repent of our disobedience. We repent for not listening to your voice when you said, wait, be patient. I'm working things out for your good. Stand firm. Count the cost if you step out of grace. Count the cost if you leave the provision I've left for you. It could cost you your very life. Oh Lord, we love you. Help us to walk in obedience before you. Help us to stand firm in the difficult seasons. Help us to give our all to you, O oh Lord. We will wait patiently for your answer. We will look, we will be like Habakkuk and stand on the wall and watch and wait for your answer to come. Lord, we love you. We worship you. King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, I lift up the people of the Philippines to you right now who are going through such a desperate struggle, desperate, devastating time of many typhoons coming through and bringing destruction to their land. But God, you are a restoration God, and so we pray for their restoration. We pray for the provisions to be made to bring this people back from the brink of destruction. <clears throat> Lord, I ask you to have mercy on them. I ask you to provide for the hurting families. I ask you to put roofs back on the destroyed homes. I ask you, Father God, to cause the waters to recede. I ask you to provide food and shelter and clothing, O oh Lord, for those that are hurting. Lord, give them peace during this time of famine. Lord, that they would expect and put their hope in you. That you, Lord, will show up and do mighty things for them. That their hearts would be made full. Because you, O oh God, have answered them from on high with the provisions that you have for them, lacking no good thing, O oh Lord, lacking no good thing. Let it be for your glory and your honor. I ask these things in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Welcome, Brother Johnson. How are you? So good to see you here. I love seeing my people from all across the lands. Bless you, brother. Bless you for your hard work you're doing in Africa. 
Bless you, Sister Myra. I just ask you all to pray for the Philippines this week and into the coming weeks as they need restoration. But God bless you all. Thank you for joining me today. And I will see you next Thursday to study Ruth chapter 2.